Holy crap. Ah! Oh, oh, this game looks cute. Three versus three gameplay. Holy crap. This game. Oh, my. Oh. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, my goodness. This looks so good. Oh. Let's just get this over with. Not gonna lie, this video may be one of the hardest I've ever had to make. Like, I've done negative topics on this channel before, but never quite like this. Which is a shame because I didn't want to feel this way about the newest Dissidia Final Fantasy game, and especially not to this degree. The Dissidia series is one I hold near and dear to my heart, with the original Dissidia game being how I got into Final Fantasy in the first place, and Dissidia Dude SM being not just my favorite Final Fantasy game, but one of my all-time favorite games, period. And as you saw from that opening clip, I was really hyped at the announcement of a third Dissidia game existing. Granted, it started off as a Japan-exclusive arcade game, launching in November of 2015, but it had been reported that Team Ninja, the team that Square Enix got to help make the new game, was developing the game using PS4-based tech. So I was hopeful. Sure enough, in summer of 2017, a console version was confirmed, under the name Dissidia Final Fantasy NT. And naturally, I was excited. I managed to partake in the closed beta over the summer, except that the servers were so poorly optimized that I got, like, two matches in, but I pre-ordered the game regardless. Fortunately for me, an open beta occurred shortly before the game's launch, so I gave it a try and... I cancelled my pre-order the next day. I didn't play a ton of it, but what I did play was, frankly, disappointing. So January 30th rolled around, The City NT was released, and much to the surprise of many, I didn't get it. Fortunately, the disappointment wasn't too hard on me to deal with given Dragon Ball Fighters had just come out a few days before. Which, by the way, play Dragon Ball Fighters, it's a very good game. But as time went on, I felt that I should probably give the full game a chance. You know, get a proper opinion of the game as a whole, not just what was essentially a demo. So I bought the game in early May, which, by the way, the fact that City NT went from its $80 launch price down to $30 within three months' time is frankly embarrassing. Played around 11 hours or so of it, and... <sighs> Look, I was expecting to dislike NT, but honestly, it legit made me really mad on more than one occasion, and by the time I was done, I felt emotionally drained from playing it. I'm not even exaggerating for the sake of entertainment, that's genuinely how I felt. But given this game got decent reviews overall and not as negative as I'm making it out to be, I guess I should probably explain why I feel this way, so you know what? I'm not gonna drag out this opening any longer. Let's just get right into it. So before I go over Dissidia NT's story, I should probably catch you up on the basics of the previous Dissidia game stories, given NT is a follow-up. Granted, there's a lot more to these plots than I'm going to be explaining, this is a Square Enix game after all, the stories get unsurprisingly complicated, but I'll just give you the basics. The Dissidia games take place in an alternate dimension called World B, and it serves as the battlegrounds for a war between the Goddess of Harmony Cosmos and the God of Discord Chaos, both of which summoning heroes and villains from the various main series Final Fantasy games as their warriors. However, the catch is that this war has actually been going on a cycle, with the fallen warriors being revived at the end of each cycle by the dragon Shinryu at the cost of their memories, which he gains power from. The second game, Dissidia Duodecim, takes place during the twelfth cycle, with Cosmos devising a plan to finally bring the cycles to an end by releasing her power for the warriors to collect in the form of crystals, which would give them the power need to defeat Chaos once and for all. And while the plan doesn't come to fruition within that cycle, in the 13th cycle, which is what the original game's story focuses on, Cosmos' champions successfully find the crystals and are able to bring down Chaos and his troops, ending the cycle and allowing them all to return home. Like I said before, there is more to these games' stories, such as history into how and why Shinryu started the cycle, and the backstories of both Cosmos and Chaos, since they're technically not actually gods. But not only would that take a while to explain, you also won't be needing to know all that for the sake of this review. Now moving on to Dissidia NT. It takes place after the 13th cycle, with many of the previously summoned heroes, alongside a few new faces, being brought to World B by a new deity, the Goddess of Protection, Materia. After they gather at her tower, she explains to them how World B is fueled by conflict, and as ruler of the dimension, she wants them all to fight each other in order to keep it alive. Though we're then introduced to another deity, the God of Destruction Spiritus, who's apparently summoned many of the villains from the cycles to serve him in his battle for conquest over World B. From there, Materia sends out her warriors to defeat Spiritus because... Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna get straight to the point. I actually never ended up finishing story mode. There are some gameplay-related reasons behind that, which I'll go into later, but in regard to the story itself, I just simply wasn't engaged in what was going on. Much like the original games, many of NT's cutscenes focus on character moments over progressing the narrative. But here's the thing. It worked in the original game's case for a few reasons. One, the story modes were massive. Dissidia's story had 15 chapters, with Dissidia Duodecim adding on 9 chapters for the 12th cycle storyline alongside side stories and a gigantic post-game chapter. 
and not only did these have tons of gameplay to them, there were also a lot of cutscenes, so they could get away with having a lot of character moment scenes since there was still plenty of room to progress the story. And two, the plot was just a lot more interesting. Both games take place on the closing end of a cycling war, and Cosmos' warriors now have essentially one last chance to end the cycle. Between that and the other plot developments that occur during the adventure, you can actually feel the stakes throughout. Granted, yes, the story overall is rather fanfiction-y, but at the end of the day, it's engaging. On the flip side, NT's story is tiny, only lasting around two hours, perhaps a bit more depending on how you do in the battles. Because of this, focusing more on character moments gives the game little to no time for story progression. Though on that note, I do have to give some credit to the writers, because quite a few said character moments are genuinely pretty good. She has the appearance of a child. Yeah, and the aura of something from your nightmares. I think they're alright. They're not having long bouts of silence or intense staring contests, are they? <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad you didn't forget about me. I did. For a bit. <laughs> oh, you're breaking my heart. Kill me now. However, when the game does take an opportunity to progress the story, well, let me just put it this way, the plot's not interesting. Like, the heroes get summoned to fight for materia, and yeah, that's it. That's the story. Okay, that's actually a bit of an exaggeration. A proper conflict is introduced later on, but that just brings an entire new batch of problems. Throughout each branch of the story, the characters witness this weird black pixel effect start to eat up areas in World B. It's later revealed that these things are called Plane Scorchers, and they're the manifestation of Shinryu, the dragon that had started the cycles of battle to begin with. Thing is, Shinryu's involvement in the previous two city games was only really dug into in in-game lore pieces, so you better hope you've played the original games and read up on the lore because Enti gives absolutely no context to who Shinryu is. Honestly, in general, Enti's story feels really incomplete and overall rushed. The first branch with Cloud and Bart amounts to nothing. The second branch with Tidus, Fury, and Enchantoto amounts to nothing. The third branch with Warrior of Light, Cecil, and Noctis has them going straight for Spiritus Tower and discovering that Spiritus isn't the enemy, but I'll get back to that in a moment. The fourth branch with Unyunite, Vaughn, and Ishtola mostly consists of Ishtola showing off that she likes to use big words, and the stuff they end up learning is also covered in the fifth branch with Terra, Squall, Zidane, and Lightning. Though the fifth branch introduces a whole different problem, that being the common trend of characters just disappearing from the story. At one point, the group of four splits into groups of two to search for the summons. I assumed that we'd see story stuff from both groups, but instead we focused just on Zidane and Terra, and all of a sudden, they're back with Squall and Lightning! Like, when did they meet up again? Actually, here are some more examples. Jack briefly shows up to help Tidus and Furion in a battle, then he disappears until the ending. Kuja shows up out of nowhere to help Zidane and Terra in a fight, then joins them and assists in finding a summon, and then disappears until the ending. Vayne shows up, fights one of the teams, and then disappears entirely from the plot. Oh, by the way, that was one of the DLC characters, so glad to know how the DLC characters are going to be incorporated into the story from here on. Garland randomly shows up to fight Warrior of Light because Destiny says so. That's literally the reason given. Then leads them to Spiritus' tower and does nothing else until the ending. Cloud of Darkness shows up in one of the first cutscenes, only to never show up again until one of the last cutscenes. Speaking of that cutscene, there's Golbez making his only appearance in the entire story. Man, remember when he was a crucial character in the last game, essentially serving as a double agent for Cosmos? Glad to see that mattered. Actually, on that note, where's Kane? He was one of the main characters in Dissidio Odessum and is in NT's base roster, yet has absolutely no involvement in this game's story. But enough about the playable character's involvement. Time to talk about the new deities because oh do I have problems with these two. Let's start with Materia. Not only does she have a frankly silly looking design, but she has like no likable qualities. She's blunt, rude, and very self-righteous, and she doesn't change at all for the very little she appears in the game. Even some of the characters become suspicious to her attitude, thinking she has another motive. And you know what? That could have been interesting. But nope, the whole plot threads drop, she just cares for world peace survival like she said. I'm sorry, but if you want me to support her in a cause, start by giving me a reason to. She's also got a really bad habit of jumping to conclusions immediately pointing fingers at Spiritus both when she sees her warriors trying to form an alliance with him to fight Shinryu, and when she realizes what Shinryu is doing. Though now I think about it, I can't blame her for doing that given the complete 180 Spiritus' character goes through. A few times in the game, it's noted that Spiritus is level-headed, rational, and overall, really not that evil of a guy, only wanting to keep World B alive as much as Materia does. Which in that case, what's with the big villain speech and the straight-up evil laughter when he first appears? This is a cruel world. And it can only be tamed by a crueler heart. <laughs> 
Like, you can't play him up as this, I'm going to conquer this world, <laughs> kind of character at the start, just to completely change his personality partway through. Hi everyone, Post Maverick here, just making a quick interjection because of something I found on Spiritus after I began editing this video. So, supposedly the reason Spiritus acts so dramatically evil at the start is because he's willingly playing the bad guy part of this conflict so Materia would want to fight him and thus generate battle energy for World B. Thing is, not only is that not very well communicated in the story, that's also kinda dumb. Spiritus could still easily go up against Materia without having to act like an over-the-top villain character, so in my opinion it just comes off as really jarring. Anyway, thought I'd add that just to clear things up. Back to the video. Now like I said earlier, I didn't end up finishing story mode, though I did make it relatively far. And based on watching the cutscenes that I didn't get to myself, I wasn't missing much. Even the finale seems really underwhelming. Materia and Spiritus reluctantly form an alliance and have their warriors fight in an all-out battle in hopes to generate enough battle energy to summon Shinryu, which by the way, the battle they use is just a slightly extended version of the game's opening cinematic. Shinryu shows up, they do a thing to him, he takes a new form, they fight him, he dies, and then following the battle we see Materia and Spiritus talking before summoning... Wait, those copies of the warriors? D did the real warriors just disappear off screen? Whatever, the fake warriors are sent forward to fight, credits. And with that, I think it's time to move on. Granted, that's not all my problems with story mode, but I'll save the rest for the gameplay portion. For now, how about we take a break from the bashing and go into something I actually liked about the game. Say what you will about Square Enix's more recent projects, but if there's one thing they've nailed almost every time, it's the visual element. They're very talented at making even their bigger stinkers at least look pretty. Unless it's a remake of an SNES game. And to City NT is absolutely no exception. The models and landscapes are wonderfully detailed, right down to dirt on faces and tears in outfits following intense battles, while keeping a generally bright and life-filled color palette. Like, while the areas in the original The City games on a technical level looked great and were distinguishable from one another, they did rely quite a bit on grays and browns for the area colors. Which while yes, this helps the characters stand out, it made some areas look a little less interesting than they probably could have. On the flip side, The City NT's areas have a much larger variety. Yes, you still get your your browns and grays, but you also get some beautiful greenery and a tropical island beach, just to name a few. Plus, each area is able to go through a visual transformation of sorts, and some of these get absolutely stunning. A dry rocky terrain turning into a flowery meadow, the skies of Midgar going red from the start of the meteor fall, and don't even get me started on the arrival of Alexander in the Final Fantasy IX stage. As for the audio, it's quite solid as well. The soundtrack consists mostly of remixes of songs from main series Final Fantasy games, plus the spin-offs that are represented in the game, some of which being taken straight from the last two Dissidia games, and some of them being brand new. And a lot of these sound really good. Granted, not all of them hit the mark, I still think a techno remix of the FF1 opening theme was a really bizarre choice, and I'm not a big fan of the game's rendition of Veiled in Black from Final Fantasy XV, just to name two examples. But then you have fantastic remixes like Bombing Mission from Final Fantasy VII, or the battle theme from Final Fantasy X, and the absolute best rendition of Battle on the Big Bridge in the entire series. The voice acting is quite strong as well, for the most part. All the returning characters have their voice actors reprising their roles, and they do just as solid of a job as before, if not better for many of them. The only exception, in my opinion, would be Shantoto, who for some reason has a completely different voice than before. Not a different voice actress, it's still Candy Milo providing the performance. She just sounds almost nothing like she did in the last two games. And somehow even more annoying. <laughs> oh, you underestimate a lady. Care to put me to the test? Our paths home are blocked as long as it draws breath. Another reason it deserves a quick death. As for the newcomers, their voice actors from their game of origin all end up returning to reprise the role, which is fine by me. More Ray Chase as Noctis is a good thing. They even got Phil Lamar back to voice Ramza, who only voiced him for the remake of Final Fantasy Tactics back in 2007. Talk about keeping to what you had established with the voice cast. That said, I'm not too fond of their choices for Materia and Spiritus in regards to their voices. Madison Davenport sounds rather unenthusiastic as Materia, which leads to some awkward sounding deliveries. I had heard tell of a lost warrior, and was quite taken aback. Thankfully, you managed to find your way to my side, hale and hearty. And while Ben Robson does an alright job with his performance as Spiritus, I just think the voice doesn't suit the design very well. I knew as little as you, and there is no shame in that. If we are to grow, however, 
We must ensure that our world grows with us. Then again, whoever they picked was in a losing battle to begin with, since they'd have to compare to Keith David as Chaos in the original Dissidia games, and that's frankly hard to top. Now surrender to the inexorable grasp of deepest, darkest pandemonium, and lose yourself to oblivion. As for the technical stuff, Dissidia T was surprisingly well polished in that regard. I did catch a few instances of clipping with the models, but it was never to a distracting state. Frame rate remained mostly at 60 frames per second, with most drops being so minuscule you wouldn't really be able to notice, and I don't ever recall experiencing any glitches, so yeah, good on ya for that devs. But with all that said, praise time is over, it's time to dive into the meat of the game. Oh boy. So Dissidia NT, like the other Dissidia games, plays very differently than really any other title in the fighting game genre. It's a 3D arena fighter, meaning you have full movement across a massive stage. But unlike most fighting games that have you just attacking the opponent to do damage to them, the Dissidia games do something a bit more unique with its bravery system. To make it brief, every character in these games have two types of attacks. Bravery attacks, which are done with the circle button, and HP attacks, which are done with the square button. When you use a bravery attack, instead of doing damage to your opponent, your bravery, the number located right above your health bar, goes up, while your opponent's bravery goes down, with you getting a bravery bonus if you get your opponent's bravery below zero, known as a bravery break. When you use an HP attack, the number your bravery is at by the end of the attack is the amount of health the opponent will lose. It's a very intuitive system that brings a lot of strategy to your choices. Do you try to build up as much bravery as possible before you use an HP attack but risk losing it to a possible enemy attack, or just wail away at them with HP attacks until they're dead? But adding on to the unique gameplay mechanics was the insane levels of customization you had at your disposal. Every character in the original games had six bravery attacks and six HP attacks. Three for on the ground, and three for in midair, determined by if you're tilting the control stick towards or away the opponent, or not at all. Basic fighting game stuff. But the thing is, every character had their own selection of bravery and HP attacks that you could freely mix and match as you see fit. So say for example, you did a cloud versus cloud match. Even though they're the same character, chances are both clouds wouldn't have the same attacks. One cloud could have cross slash as their standard ground HP attack, while the other cloud could have meteor rain, a very different attack from cross slash, as their standard ground HP attack. I know this may all sound a bit confusing, but it's honestly a huge element to what makes the Dissidia games so great. There was so much room to take these characters and customize their moveset to one that best suited you. Between that and the large amount of maneuverability in the battle arena, with the ability to climb walls or grind on set pieces or quickly dash to or from your opponents, fights in the Dissidia games were frantic, a bit chaotic at times, but above all else, tons of fun. Now let's go over how Dissidia NT screwed it all up. First and foremost, I should go over the biggest change made to the Dissidia formula in NT, since that serves as the core to a lot of my problems with the gameplay. Unlike the original games, which were 1v1 battles, NT decides to instead make the game 3v3 battles. We're not talking like Maul vs. Capcom or Dragon Ball Fighters where you swap out characters. All the fighters are on the battlefield and participating at the same time. You can probably already guess several problems that would come from this change, but we'll go over them one at a time. To start, having to deal with three enemies at the same time is frustrating. It's near impossible to get any sort of effective attack done on someone without getting suddenly interrupted by another enemy. And if two or three enemies are attacking you at the same time, you're not getting out of there. Yes, there is a minimap thing on the right to show if other characters are nearby, but in the heat of the battle, you're bound to ignore it and see it as just another thing to clutter the already ridiculously busy UI. It's all technically necessary information for battle, and to be honest, I don't know what more could have been done to make the UI less of an issue, not to mention it had already been altered a ton from the arcade version's UI, which was just an utter mess. But it's still something that can be a hassle to deal with. Now you may be thinking, what about your allies? Can't they help you? Well, yes they can, but if you're playing offline, you might as well be doing a 1v3. Offline, your teammates are, of course, computer controlled, but your ally AI aren't the most reliable 90% of the time. And this isn't helped at all by the new win conditions. Oh yeah, you thought just KOing all three members of the team would be what you need to win? Not the case here. Instead, each team has three lives, and whenever someone on that team gets killed, a team life is lost and the character will respawn a few seconds later. Basically, if you've got a single weak link in your team's chain, you're as good as done. And guess what? An AI ally's death counts to a team life loss. In other words, it is 100% possible to lose a match entirely because of your AI allies. In fact, it happened on multiple occasions for me. Special mention to a particular battle in story mode that took me a full hour to beat because my AI allies kept getting killed and cost me the match. Genius idea, devs. Though that's not the only problem with the gameplay, because the devs decided to do something that still baffles me to this day. Remember what I said earlier about the levels of customization you had in the original Dissidia games? How you could essentially make any character your own by selecting the moves they use? 
use. Yeah, Dissidian T scrapped that entirely. All bravery attacks are now preset with no way of switching them around. And as for the HP attacks, well, you are still able to select your HP attack. But here's the thing, instead of being able to have six HP attacks, you only have one. Whether you're tilting the control stick or in the air or not, all inputs will give you the exact same HP attack. That'd be like if in the next Super Smash Bros. game, you could only have one special attack on the B button. Like, say you picked a fireball for Mario, and no matter if you pressed up and B or down and B, you'd still just get the fireball. That's what the City NT does, and it's not only such a confusing decision, but many HP attacks are only suited for use on ground or in the air, which can make it really awkward to deal damage when it's your only means of doing so. Speaking of features they removed, let's talk about a mechanic from the originals that I didn't mention earlier. See, when you landed attacks in the original games, these little bluish-white particles would appear. Consuming these would fill up your EX gauge, which was like a super meter of sorts. When it was full, you could activate your EX mode, which would buff character stats, give some characters new abilities like health regeneration or even new attacks, but above all else, it would give the player the ability to use an EX burst, a super attack which would require you to do a unique input for the character, and when done perfectly would take a lot of bravery and thus do a ton of damage, while also providing a visually stunning spectacle. And much like the customization element, Dissidy NT removed the mechanic entirely. They've now been replaced with these abilities called EX skills. One EX skill, the one designated to the triangle button, is an ability exclusive for each character. For some, it would serve as an EX mode-esque transformation, while for others it'd be a gimmicky ability as a means to make the character more quote-unquote unique. The other two EX skills, performed by pressing triangle while tilting the control stick, are picked before a battle and are all abilities that every character has access to. Stuff like a poison spell or a health regen spell, buffs, debuffs, all that. And while it technically is a more balanced mechanic than EX mode and EX bursts were in the original, EX skills are just not nearly as fun to use. It replaced what was a unique and fun feature with a simplistic system that kind of feels like it's only here because other team-based PvP games also have characters using abilities, right down to them having long cooldowns and everything. That said, there is a new special bar in NT, this time for Team Summons. In the original games, you were able to equip a summon to your character and use it for a slight advantage gain, like multiplying your bravery or draining your opponent of theirs, stuff like that. But it was just an extra element to the customization. In NT, summons are a much more prominent mechanic. Before you start a match, your team votes for which summon to use in the match, and by attacking these crystals that appear occasionally on the battlefield, you can build up your summon meter. Once it's full, your team can use a summon, which instead of giving a slight advantage gain, it plays a cinematic of the summon creature appearing before absolutely coating the arena with attacks. Seriously, when you're on the opposing team, there's so little room for avoiding a summon's attacks, it's beyond irritating to deal with. But at the same time, there's no real strategy to using a summon. With EX first, you still have to do the inputs perfectly to get the best results. In NT, you just build up your summon meter, use the summon, and then let it do the work for you. Also, on the top of summons, the second a crystal appears on your arena, your AI allies will abandon the battle completely to go after it. Thanks guys, leave me behind to get beat up, really appreciate it. But beyond the removal and replacement of key mechanics, there are other issues I have with NT's gameplay. For one, the game just feels slow. General movement, attacks, even dashing, it feels like it all happens slower than in the previous games. Like, here's an example of dashing in the original, and here's dashing in NT. You see what I mean? Adding on to that, even though the arenas are a lot bigger and visually more varied than the previous games, they're also a lot less interesting structurally. Almost every arena in the first two games had both a horizontal and vertical element to them, making for some truly dynamic battles. Meanwhile, pretty much none of the arenas in NT have a vertical element to them, and the ones that do have some have very little. It's nice that there's a larger variety of locales for battles as opposed to most arenas being main series final dungeons like in the originals, but very little is done to make them interesting beyond the setting. Now I have a feeling some of you might be tired of me constantly using comparisons to the original games as my means of pointing out problems I have with this one. And while I can justify that off the fact that NT is a sequel, and it as a sequel takes several steps back even past the first game in the series, I'll instead take this opportunity to go over more of what's fully new in NT. For one, there's a new mode called Core Battles, in which the two teams have a crystal to protect. Whichever team breaks the opposing crystal first wins, but the crystal will be shielded if any of its team is in range of it, meaning you've got to strategize if you're going to go offensive or defensive. Now imagine this mode could be fun to play online with human players, but offline I freaking hate this this mode. Due to the nature of the AI, very rarely will either side even go for crystal. But the second you go to destroy the enemy's crystal, the enemy team is immediately on you. But will your allies come to help? Of course not. Though that's not all this game adds. It's also got loot boxes. Yep, the city NT decided to incorporate everyone's favorite gaming trend. Pretty brave of you developers, especially after the Battlefront 2 scandal. Now to give a brief moment of praise, this is actually the best way I've ever seen loot boxes handled in any game. Because not only is everything you get in them solely cosmetic, but you're unable to buy them with real money. Actually, you can't buy them with any money. You only get them from getting your player level up, much like how Overwatch gives you a free loot box when you level up. But while this is the best handling of loot boxes I've personally seen, that then begs the question,
question, if you can't buy them with real money, what's the point of including them in the first place? I know that sounds hypocritical to praise them for being free only to criticize them for the same reason, but like, the whole purpose of the loot box was to get extra money out of players, either to further support the game's development or just to fill companies' pockets. I get the feeling you were originally gonna be able to buy them with real money and they dropped that after what happened with Battlefront 2, but without that element, Dissidia NT's loot boxes feel like they were put in just because it was the trend at the time. The loot boxes aren't the only thing you get from leveling up, and with that, it's now time to finally get to those gameplay elements surrounding the story mode, which are easily the things I hated the most about the game. So in most fighting games, when there's a story mode, how do you progress? You complete a part of the story, then you move on to the next part. Rinse and repeat. Well, the City NT decided to do story progression a bit differently. The story mode menu is organized like a skill tree, and to unlock an event in the story, you need to use up a Memoria point, which you get alongside loot boxes by leveling up. Let me rephrase that to help emphasize how stupid this is. You have to level grind to unlock the ability to continue story mode. And believe me, it can take a while to level up in this game, and you need 30 Memoria points to finish the entire story. Oh, but my problems with story mode don't end there. Most of the story mode events are cutscenes for the uninteresting story it's got going, but every once in a while you do get some battles, most of which suffering the gameplay's regular issues with a few battles taking it one step further, like a 2v3 battle you have to do in Cloud and Bart's route. You'd be surprised how much more aggravating it is to play when the enemy team has one less AI punching bag to go after. Despite this, I was willing to bear with it and try to get to the end of story mode. But then the boss fights happened. Yes, littered throughout story mode are boss fights against the summons. And you know what? Initially, I was kind of excited. Fighting the summons seemed like a neat idea. And unlike in main battles, you didn't lose team lives from your AI allies dying. All three of those lives were yours and yours alone. But then I actually fought the bosses and just... Ugh. I've only ever fought three of the bosses, Shiva, Rama, and Odin, and I hated every single one of them. You're only able to do damage to them once they've been hit enough with bravery attacks, but not only is there absolutely no way to tell how close they are to becoming vulnerable, you're only ever going to have time to get one, maybe two hits in before they're invulnerable again. Not at all helped by their onslaught of attacks that can take up a large chunk of the arena and give you very little time to avoid them. But once you get the boss to half health, they decide to pull out their exclusive bullcrap card. For Shiva, it's cloning herself, resulting in twice the amount of rapid attacks that can freeze you in place, and the need to bring down two targets down to zero health. For Rama, it's littering the arena constantly with lightning bolts that stun you. And while there are crystals to destroy that make the lightning bolts stop appearing, not only do they respawn, but focusing on the crystals basically makes you an open target to Rama's constant attacking. And for Odin, I didn't even make it to the second phase. After dealing with his fast movement at ridiculous range for half an hour and not once managing to get into a vulnerable state, I gave up. At that point, my patience with the game had run out. Though with all that said, there's one more element of the game I need to talk about. During the waiting period for Dissidia NT to come out, the game's director mentioned in an interview the idea of Dissidia NT being played as an eSport. And as I was playing the game, I very quickly realized it was more than just an idea. The game was being pushed as an eSport. The switch to 3v3 gameplay to make it a team-based PvP game, the removal of heavy character customization to make a more consistently balanced roster, the minimal amount of effort put into story mode, pushing story progression into level grinding, alongside the elements more commonly seen in PvP games, namely the cooldown-based EX skills and the loot boxes, and above all else, the literal center focus on online play, which by the way doesn't have a casual match option, only ranked match. Maybe I'm completely off my rocker for thinking this, but it really feels like Square Enix and Team Ninja took this unique arena fighter and stripped it down so it could be the next League of Legends or the next Overwatch. And as someone who not only played the original Dissidia games and loved them for the fun factor that came from its unique creative gameplay aspects, but also played League of Legends and Overwatch as a very casual player, I'm honestly really disappointed by this decision. There was already a target audience established for Dissidia, and the choices made with Dissidia NT seemed to cause the game to abandon a lot of its already established fan base in favor of trying to grasp the attention of an entirely new audience. And judging the reports that Dissidia NT's been underperforming pretty badly, that gamble certainly didn't seem to pay off. So I might as well just get this out of the way. Shadow of the Colossus definitely isn't my number one most disappointing game anymore. And like I said at the start, that's an absolute shame, because I was genuinely really excited for this game. It's a sequel to one of my all-time favorite games, and just the fact that another Dissidia title was even happening was like, the most exciting thing to me. But lo and behold... Ugh. Though looking back, it is still strange how by the end of me playing what I did of NT, I wasn't feeling super furious or anything, just drained. As one of my friends put it, I sounded dead inside nearing the end of my time with NT, and have honestly never felt that way from a game before or since. Needless to say, I was quick to exchange my copy, and I've yet to look back, nor do I think I ever will. In fact, I'm gonna be honest, I don't even think the inclusion of Tifa as DLC would be enough to get me back. Dissidia NT may not be, on a technical level, one of the worst games I've ever played. Believe me, I've played some utter 
garbage in that regard. But it is, without a doubt, up there as one of my all-time least favorite games. At least some terrible games like Big Rigs are fun to mess with, but NT didn't even have that going for it. And because of its underwhelming sales, I'm feeling there's a chance we may never see anything Dissidia related for quite some time. This has been Black Mage Maverick, and I'm gonna go find something to hug. Have a nice day, everybody. Also, what does NT even mean? I'm personally putting my bet on not tolerable, but feel free to make your own guesses in the comments. I'd like to see how creative you guys get.